Will we get to visit Numenor? When will Sauron show up? And what are Halffoots? Amazon's A Ring of Power features new characters and uncharted lands. Here's what you need to know. The upcoming series wasn't called The Lord of the Rings A Rings of Power in August of 2021. The studio hadn't announced an official title yet, and fans commonly referred to the project as Amazon's Lord of the Rings series, or something along those lines. And yet, even without a title, the show went ahead and announced the premiere of its first episode, which would air more than a year in the future. On August 2nd of 2021, Amazon published a press release that included a gorgeous first series image and the announcement that episode 1 would drop on September 2nd of 2022. While fans have had to literally wait for years at this point, the good news is that they won't have to wait for much longer. The Lord of the Rings The Rings of Power had little to no visual promotional elements for the first four years of its existence. But once 2022 kicked off, we got a sudden flood of promotional videos. The first of these is an epic title reveal declaring that the show would be called Lord of the Rings The Rings of Power. Then Amazon went and upped the ante by releasing a full 60-second trailer during the Super Bowl. The trailer didn't reveal too much detailed information, but it did finally give us a solid glimpse of the world that Amazon is building to house this Middle-earth stories. From sweeping panoramas to CGI monsters to a slew of characters, the trailer created an instant buzz and a variety of different levels of feedback. It was so heavily viewed that it broke the first day trailer record, getting 257 million views worldwide in just 24 hours. On July 8th, another 60-second teaser officially dropped, ending with an announcement that another teaser would be arriving on the 14th of that same month. When that day arrived, fans refreshed their browsers with bated breath and were rewarded at last with a full two-and-a-half-minute trailer that went deep into the details. The trailer focuses on the passage of time. Elves discuss past glory and failures. Men speak of moving forward and leaving the past behind. Dwarves who are in their prime drawing rings of power talk of a new era to come. The trailer also puts the show's incredible production quality on full display. Scene after scene was shown, shifting from jaw-dropping panoramas to lively civilizations. Orgs flash on the screen for a moment. Elrond and Galadriel verbally spar over their tragic past experiences. The High Elven King Gilgalad utters foreboding words about an impending evil. After months of virtually nothing to gauge how the show was going to feel, the second trailer effectively functioned as a full-blown reveal of how epic the Rings of Power experience could be. It will be the end, not just of our people, but all peoples. With so much money and manpower going into the series, what story are they going to tell? While fans are used to the stories of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, this time Amazon's narrative will be going much further afield, and further back in time too. The show will cover events that take place in the Second Age of Tolkien's world. This is a roughly 3,500-year-long era that comes before the 3,000-year-long Third Age, which ends with the events of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. If 3,500 years feels like a very long span of time, that's because, well, it is. In fact, showrunners J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay have already clarified that the biggest deviation from the text is the simple fact that they've condensed all of the events of the Second Age into a single point in time. According to Payne, We talked with the Tolkien estates. If you are true to the exact letter of the law, you are going to be telling a story in which your human characters are dying off every season, because you're jumping 200 years in time. And then you're not meeting really big, important canon characters until Season 4. Along with this major adjustment to the pace of the narrative, the showrunners have explained that they only have the rights to the Lord of the Rings trilogy and The Hobbit. However, this gives them critical access to the appendices of The Return of the King, which includes a brief outline of events in the Second Age. Working from this, they will try to bring together a coherent, condensed, and compelling Second Age narrative. One of the biggest concerns of any on-screen fantasy or sci-fi adaptation is how the show will utilize CGI. Even within the hollowed world of Middle-earth, overuse of computer graphics has already wreaked havoc on the Hobbit trilogy. Fortunately, Rings of Power addressed this very real concern from the get-go. When the show's title reveal video was released, it featured an impressive title drop. Later, a behind-the-scenes video was released showing everything from the mold to fog machines and even the pouring of real bona fide molten metal. It was a great way to showcase the series' commitment to practical effects. 
Since that time, the cast and showrunners have relentlessly reinforced the idea that Rings of Power isn't doing the bulk of its filming in front of a green screen, in the same spirit as Peter Jackson's venerated two-decade-old Lord of the Rings trilogy. Most shows need to approach production one season at a time. Not so with Rings of Power. This is a series that has a five-season story arc already fully planned from beginning to end. According to showrunner J.D. Payne, we even know what our final shot of the last episode is going to be. This was a big story with a clear beginning, middle, and end. There are things in the first season that don't pay off until season 5. Meanwhile, the eyebrow-raising budget of the Rings of Power production has steadily drawn comments and criticism from the beginning. In an interview with Empire, J.D. Payne offered a rebuttal to concerns about the Rings of Power budget. And it has to do with treating the Rings of Power experience not as a show, but as a movie. The showrunner explained, We think it's important to keep the budget in context. Really, this season is an eight-hour movie. This is the length of three Marvel films, done on the schedule of two for the budget of one. Look at it in the context of what's actually being produced, and you could say that it's a bargain. Everyone loves the Ents. The tree folk are a fan-favorite element of the Lord of the Rings story. And while they're certainly important in the Third Age, the events we see in the Lord of the Rings really amount to little more than the last hurrah for the group. In fact, the most important part of Tree Beard and his species story happens during the Second Age, which is when the Rings of Power is set. From the get-go, this prompted a crucial question. Will the Ents be in the show? It's an inquiry that was officially answered in early July, when a Rings of Power teaser showed the Tree folk for the first time. The quick and subtle reveal all but confirms that Ents will be in the show. Pippin and Merry would be pleased. It's talking, Merry. The tree is talking. Tree? I am no tree. The villain of the Rings of Power has been set in stone from the get-go. Let's not beat around the bush here. It's Sauron. Tolkien made that clear in the source material. The Second Age is a time when Sauron rises and takes the place of his fallen master, the original Dark Lord Morgoth. As far as has been revealed, the show hasn't deviated from this line of reasoning. In fact, the initial synopsis of The Rings of Power, which was leaked well before its premiere, states that, Hope hung by the finest of threads, and the greatest villain that ever flowed from Tolkien's pen threatened to cover all the world in darkness. While it isn't explicitly stated, it takes all of two seconds to connect the dots. It's safe to assume that the greatest villain that ever flowed from Tolkien's pen is the Dark Lord Sauron. And yet, for all the clarity, the villain for the first season of the show remains cloaked in mystery. Early on, a leak from the fansite OneRing.net clarified that Sauron will not be revealed in Season 1. If true, that means our heroes are going to be facing some other villains for a while. We've already seen trolls and orcs in the promotional material. And a Saruman once said, Do you know how the orcs first came into being? They were elves once. The Rings of Power has its work cut out for itself when it comes to filling its iteration of Middle-earth with compelling, relatable characters. Why? Because Tolkien never wrote much about this period of his world's history. Instead, he focused on outline-level material, much of which the showrunners and writers have had to connect and fill in to create enough substance for a 50-hour story. This could be the beginning of a new era. Part of that process has been inventing new characters. This is an absolute necessity, since there are very few names in the source material, but it's also a task that is fraught with peril. Inventing characters out of whole cloth and expecting them to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the deep, thoughtful characters created by the original author is a tall order. It remains to be seen if Amazon's new personalities will be able to hold their own in Middle-earth. One exciting prospect of the Rings of Power is the opportunity to see new areas of Middle-earth that have not been seen on the silver screen. The bitter cold northern terrain called the Forward Wave was already showcased in the Super Bowl trailer for one. We're also going to head to the left of the map, across the gigantic sundering seas that separate Middle Earth from the blessed realm away in the west, where Frodo and Bilbo sail to at the end of the Return of the King. In the middle of this ocean lies the island nation of Numenor. This is where Aragorn's ancestors live, and it's a really important area that is often mentioned in The Lord of the Rings. However, by that time, the island is long gone, thanks to events that transpire, you guessed it, during the Rings of Power story. The chance to see Numenor in its heyday and meet many of the famous characters that dwell on its shores is an exciting prospect. Hobbits have no place in the larger stories of Middle-earth before the Third Age. At least, that's what Tolkien wrote. 
One area where the Rings of Power narrative seems to deviate from the source material, though, is with the subject of halfling history. The show has been careful to honor the fact that Third Age hobbits really do live entirely outside of the story. However, they've taken a leap by choosing to incorporate Halffoots into their own Second Age narrative. Who are Halffoots? They're basically proto-hobbits. The prologue to The Fellowship of the Ring states that, Before the crossing of the Misty Mountains, the hobbits had already become divided into three somewhat different breeds – Halffoots, Stewards, and Fallowhides. Now, this is still referencing very late Hobbit history, much later than the time of Rings of Power. Nevertheless, the show has gone ahead and incorporated a group of halflings, which they're calling Halffoots, into the story. If you're picturing overweight, comfortable hobbits living in well-tended holes in the Shire, you're wrong. The Halffoots are nomadic. They're survivors, and they aren't anywhere near their descendants' comfortable chunk of idyllic rural countryside. While a lot of details remain to be seen, it will be fascinating to see how the show tries to work a group of halflings into a story where Tolkien himself clearly never intended to have them involved. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite upcoming TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.